the whole course of statistics is broken up into two major sections, really three, but two major statistical sections, the first one being called descriptive statistics. Then we had a little section on probability, which is not really a branch of statistics, it's really a branch of mathematics, like we had the normal distribution, binomial, and stuff like that. And then the last part of the course called inferential statistics, inferential, inferential, are those, are those parts of statistics that help you draw inferences or conclusions from your data, such as hypothesis testing, confidence intervals. So let's, in fact, write that down. Differential statistics chapter 8 was uh, confidence intervals. Chapter 9, I'm sorry, uh, let, me, let, me, let me organize this a little differently. So inferential statistics, as far as we're concerned, consists of two basic techniques. The first one was called confidence intervals. And that happened to be, we had two versions of the formula. There was the, the Z version and the T version. The Z version, you only needed to know for the, um, for the, you only needed to know for the um, spinner assignment, but it wasn't on the test, I think. <laughs> And the T version, again, the formula X bar plus or minus Z times sigma over N. And the T version is X bar plus or minus T times S over N. And that, by the way, reminds you of the basic distinction between them. When you know the population standard deviation, which is hardly ever happening in real life, you go to the Z version. But when you know the sample standard deviation, which we just started talking about last time in chapter 9 again, then you go to the T version. Then the other half of the inferential statistics is called hypothesis testing. And that consists of two basic types. The first type, which is chapter 9, is called one sample hypothesis testing. Meaning you just have a single sample, you're like, you know, mu equal 4.5, mu not equal to 4.5, you take a single sample, and you make a conclusion from that sample about the single population parameter, in this case mu. But chapter 10, which we're going to learn about, I guess, next time, or the time after that, is going to be called two-sample hypothesis testing. So when you, when you see a problem, your first question should be, especially on that last test where we're, again, for the final, I'm sorry, for the fourth test, this will not be a problem because in the fourth test, all we're going to only have is hypothesis testing. There will not be any confidence intervals on it. There won't be any probability. For example, what's the probability X bar is bigger than some number, which is chapter 7. That will not be on the, the fourth test that counts as a grade. But it might be on, on, the, on the last test. So when you see a problem, you have to decide, before you do the problem, obviously, you have to decide what kind of problem is it. Is it a probability problem? Is it a confidence interval problem? Or is it a hypothesis testing problem? Once you decide by reading the question that it's a hypothesis testing problem, the next thing to worry about, is it a one sample problem, which we've been doing for the last couple of weeks? Or is it going to be, and I should make this into a 10, or is it chapter 10, which we're going to learn about at some point, called two sample problem, which, for example, you want to compare one average to another average, the average male amount of smoking versus the average female amount of smoking. Two different groups of people, two different samples, two different populations. Now, getting back to chapter 9, what we're learning about currently, the next distinction is between what? The Z and the T. We had, you know, we had the formula Z equals X bar minus mu over sigma over N. That was the one formula we spent most of our time learning about, you know, using the spinner assignment. And then most recently, we learned about the fact for today's homework, X bar minus mu over S over N. And again, which one do you use? For the test, you could only use this one because that's what the book t uh, focuses on, because that's more practical and more realistic. But for the spinner assignment, we also had the sigma version. And make sure when you hand in the spinner assignment, you know which one is which. Zintite. Now, this particular problem breaks up into one more distinction. And that's what we started talking about at the end of the last class, and I'll be showing you that today mainly. I just sort of talked about it, well, just, you know, we're going to do it next time, but now is next time. What was, what was that last distinction? Or these are all the different subsections that you need to know for the, this current material. What's the last thing I made the distinction about? And since, uh, as we speak, millions of gigabytes of, not millions, millions of bytes of, of, of tape is being wasted while we're waiting for an answer. What was the last thing? Look at your notes, but I made a little, maybe you didn't write it down because I just sort of talked about it. What was the thing we talked about at the very end of the last class? No. 
No, that's the whole thing is H0 or H1, yes. Direction, remember I talked about that if you have uh, two types of the formulas, a non-directional, where essentially non-direction to, to directional, where basically you take the alpha and you chop it in half. Now, I don't really teach this officially to you, I'm gonna teach you that today, but, but, but I'm just sort of, we need this to make this diagram complete. And the other kind of thing is called directional, where the, the only big difference is you don't chop the alpha in half. And we talk, and I mentioned why we do that, and I'll repeat that again, because I think if you didn't pay attention at the end of the last class, this makes no sense, but that's it. Now, what about the two sample stuff? Well, the two sample chapter, jumping ahead and completing, I'm not sure if I'll repeat this outline again later on, the two sample also has a distinction between Z and T, and likewise, the Z you're not gonna be responsible for because, because we're not gonna do it. It looks like here you're not responsible. You're only for the spinner assignment, maybe, but here like only spinner. So it's only gonna be the T. And again, there's gonna be two types, directional and non-directional. But before we get into that, there's another theoretical distinction we have to make, which is what's called independent and dependent. And again, I didn't really officially want to teach you, teach you that today, but you might as well pay attention and have notes, and we should might as well have it on video. When you do a two-sample problem, let's say we want to compare the smoking habits of men and women. Okay, you take an average of men, average of women, compare them. The hypothesis is going to be here, for example, the hypothesis like we did in mu equal some number, 4.5 or something like that, versus the H1 mu not equal to that number. But for the two-sample hypothesis testing, again, I'm jumping ahead a lot, we're gonna can take two populations with two averages, so it's gonna be a comparison between the two averages. So the, the chapter 10 is gonna look like this, mu1 not equal to mu2, if there's no direction. And then later on we'll learn about if mu1 is bigger than mu2, which means there's a direction. But that's, again, jumping ahead too many, too many steps. But when you compare the men to the women, there are two ways you can, you, can, you can think of that experiment being con constructed or designed. You can take 25 men walking around campus at random, take 25 women walking around campus at random, and get their averages. You know, you're going to get the average of the first group, the average of the second group. You're going to compare them, and that's, in fact, going to be the formula we're going to use. So that will be called the independent version of the two-sample problem because the two groups of people don't know about each other. The first number here and the first number here just happen to be near each other just by coincidence. On the other hand, if you take 25 couples, because maybe the smoking habits of one have an impact on the other, maybe this way you guarantee that the, the age is similar because it's a couple, maybe you guarantee that the, the, the socioeconomic status of the couple is similar, so this way you don't have to worry about maybe the men and women are very different types of people. By taking couples, but then already the two sets of numbers have to do with each other, that one depends upon the other. So you have a different version of the formula. It's not a big difference, but it's a different version of the formula. So when you see a problem in chapter, so again, if you saw or see a problem on the, the, the so-called final, the fifth test, you sit there, you see three examples. The first, you scratch your head and say, what, what am I supposed to do here? Say, oh, it's a probability problem. So you gotta whip out the probability of, you know, what's the chance that they take a sample of numbers, the average is greater, that's chapter seven. Or you look at it and say, hold one second, that looks like a confidence interval. So you gotta ask yourself, is it gonna be a Z or a T? Well, you don't have to worry about that because I'm telling you that you're only responsible for the T, for the, the, the stuff on the, the online or for the class, stuff we're doing on the test. Now let's say you read this example and it says, oh, is there, is there evidence of a difference between blah, 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 evidence of a difference, they tell you the significance level, but clearly, clearly de dealing with hypothesis testing. So once you recognize the paragraph is talking about hypothesis testing, the next thing you should ask yourself, is it one sample or two samples? Well, that's pretty obvious. You can, you know, if it says one of every, one average, one sample size, it's one sample. If it says two averages, two standard deviations, two sample sizes, two of everything, then it's gonna be chapter 10, okay? Now, assuming you recognize that it happens to be chapter one sample, do you have to worry about the Z or the T? No, it's just gonna be the T. That's not really a practical worry you have to ask yourself when you're reading the question carefully, because it's gonna definitely say the sample standard deviation. But then you do have to worry about, is there a direction in the problem? Does it say more than, less than, greater than, exceeds at most? Is there a direction? Or, like we had until this point, simply is one number different than another number, non-directional? So that's something you have to think about by reading the paragraph. And assuming you recognize that we're talking about chapter 10 type problem of two sample, again, you're gonna have to make one more distinction. Are these two sets of numbers sort of lined up together, 